Why do people like me talk about manual mode such a lot? Why is it people aspire to shoot in manual mode? What's so special about manual mode when you've got all those different creative settings and semi-auto modes and program modes and auto modes? It's because there are some hidden superpowers going on in the background. And once you understand how they interact with your manual exposure settings, you can use whatever mode you like because you'll know what's going on inside your camera and you'll know how to guide it, regardless of mode, to reach the destination, the result, the image that you want to take. Let's go for a ride up the road and I'll see if I can explain this a little better. Something that can really cook your noodle about the exposure triangle is that there are times when settings don't actually matter. I know, weird isn't it? But when you're not playing around with those superpowers that I mentioned back in the office, they really don't. So long as you get a sharp picture at the exposure you want. Wonderful, what a beautiful day. Let's get to it. Just before we get started, I want to give a big thank you shout out to my sponsors, photo sharing site Clickersnap. There is an all new, all singing and dancing one with massively improved functionality coming out somewhere around November. Also, thank you to Bike Ahead, suppliers of the most premium motorcycle gear in the world. Everything that I am wearing comes from Bike Aheads. Go and check out their site. If you're a photographer and you don't like kneeling on the ground because, hey, you know, it hurts, pebbles and things stuck in your knee. Get yourself a pair of these PMJ motorcycle jeans. They're made of Kevlar, they will never wear out, and they've got padded knees. You can kneel on anything from bar wide to broken glass. There are links in the description with this video, so please go and check them out. It's thanks to them that we're even doing this. Right, I'll finish sorting my cameras out. We'll have a little chat about the mysteries of exposure. Let's recap. What do these exposure controls do? Your shutter speed is a bit like a tap. If you turn it on and off very quickly, you only get a couple of little drops of water come out. If you turn it on and leave it on for a long time, you get a complete flood of water. Imagine the water is the light. And so, looking at our scene here, if I just frame it up with the river there, and I use a thousandth of a second, because it is quite a bright day, there we go, it looks like that. Fantastic. If I increase that shutter speed, make it twice as fast, then only half the light comes in and it starts to look very dark. If I halve the shutter speed to a 500th of a second, then it starts to get bright. You probably know that already. What about the aperture? Aperture is kind of like the size of your tap. If you've got a big tap, like a fire hydrant, then tons of light or water is gonna come flying out of it. You're only using a little tiny tap, like a little eyedropper or something is only gonna be a little bit. It's like an iris in your eye. It gets bigger and it gets smaller. So if we take our picture, if we make the aperture twice as big, then the picture gets twice as bright because there's more light coming in. If we make the aperture or tap twice as small, then it gets twice as dark, simple. So what's the ISO? That's a little bit like skin sensitivity. Some people can go out in the sun for ages. They don't get burnt. A bit like me, really. I'm very, very lucky. I am a low sensitivity to sun. That means I'm a low ISO. It means I can put a lot of light, sunlight, onto my body, onto my arms, onto my face before I start to burn. Other people, they might only go out for a few moments and they're starting to go red. They're high sensitivity. They're a high ISO. So why have we got these three controls? Why do you have to juggle these three? It's because of those superpowers. You would need to choose a particular shutter aperture or ISO for creative reasons. So your shutter also controls how we portray movement. I'm gonna set a slow-ish shutter speed, fairly as slow as I can go, I think, and zoom as I press the shutter you see, you get that movement blur effect. 
if you've got a really fast shutter speed, let's go back to a thousandth and do the same thing, it ain't gonna work. It will still freeze the action. Because the shutter speed is so fast, it's freezing that movement. So you'd use the slow shutter speed when you wanna blur things and a fast shutter speed when you wanna freeze them. The easiest way to show you the effect of an aperture is in video mode. Right now, I'm rolling at F4. Watch what happens as we make that aperture smaller. Look at the background. Our little piece of fern has disappeared into the background. It's got a lot sharper, hasn't it? As we open up that aperture and make that tap bigger, you get a shallow depth of field. Aperture is the main control, the primary fine control for depth of field. It's not the only thing at play here, but it is the primary one. So what does that mean? As photographers, you would make creative choices about whether the shutter speed is the most important or the aperture is the most important. They would become your primary control. You want to work with depth of field, aperture is most important. So you set that first. Then you would set your shutter speed. Now, whatever that combination is to give you the creative look may not be the correct exposure. And that is why you have your suntan ISO, because you can then adjust the ISO to compensate for your creative choices with the other controls. So what was that thing about sometimes the settings you use really don't matter? If you're not using creative superpowers, such as freezing or blurring movement, using depth of field, then you could use many different combinations of settings and still get the same exposure. We've got a nice little view down here into the valley. I'm not using any depth of field. There isn't any movement to play with. We're just going to shoot a shot looking across the valley like that with the river in the bottom. I wish the sun would come out. We'd have a little bit more light. It would look a whole world nicer. But hey, you can't have everything. Hey, look at that. Am I the luckiest guy in the world? A little bit of sunlight has just started to perk up. What's the exposure? Right now, <laughs> it's gone back down again. Let's go to, right, so a thousandth of a second at F7 is the correct exposure there. But it is also the same exposure as a five hundredth of a second at F10 which is also the same exposure as a 250th of a second at F14. Let's just look at those. Can you see any difference? No, I'm not fiddling around and doing anything in post-production. And if you don't believe the different shots, just look where the clouds are. You see they're in different places. This is what I meant about the settings don't matter if you're not using creative superpowers with one small caveat, and that is something called camera shake. Those are little movements of our hands. If you let that shutter speed go too slow, then you could get a blurry photo. Now this is more way beyond the remit of one small YouTube video. However, if you'd like to come and check out my masterclass in photography, I'm giving away seven free lessons right now. Click the little link in the top right of your screen. Go and get those seven free lessons because they're valuable and they give you a taste for what masterclass looks like. But it will go in depth, super deep dive on all the things we've just talking about so that when you go somewhere, you get your camera out, it'll be effortless and easy and you will be able to make an informed choice about using a semi mode, an auto mode, or a full manual mode. It is your choice. They're all roads that lead to different destinations, but it is very important that you understand manual because then you know what the camera's doing. I hope you found that useful. Be well, take care, and I'll see you next time.